you think places like Ancestry DNA and 23andMe do with your DNA after they send you the test results. My research led me to an unexpected conclusion, being that social media networks and DNA test sites have a lot in common, specifically as it relates to data collection and third-party involvement. Because, spoiler alert, outlined in the terms of service that you're supposed to read before you spit into a tube and ship it back to the testing facility, both Ancestry DNA and 23andMe disclose that they will store your DNA and might even sell it to a third party. Doesn't this sound familiar to Facebook's treatment of your data? The data that we willingly give them, telling the social network where we work, who we're friends with, and when we're traveling. The social media network knows what we look like and where we've been based on the photos we post. They have our emails and our phone numbers and our physical location based on our IP address. And in this respect, the connection between data mining and DNA mining is you. You are the resource. You're not the customer. You're the product. In the age of social media and open data, we're comfortable sharing highly personal information online. And I guess our own DNA code is no exception. Except in the case of DNA testing, you're actually paying the companies to make a buck off the most unique thing about you. But again, it's all stated in the terms and conditions, which I'm not saying makes it right, but it means you should know what you're getting into. Ancestry.com, who currently markets their DNA kits with the lure of tracing your family generations back to a family tree or uncovering your ethnicity with Ancestry DNA. And in their terms of service, it states that Ancestry DNA will internally analyze users' results to make discoveries in the study of genealogy, anthropology, evolution, languages, cultures, medicine, and other topics. What has become the largest for-profit genealogy company in the world was started by Paul Allen and Dan Taggart. They originally started out as a company called Infobases, which offered Latter-day Saints publications on discs in 1990. And now, decades later, what they started has morphed into the world's foremost site for people to go research their roots. Ancestry.com was bought out in 2012, and Paul Allen remains a serial entrepreneur now living in Washington, D.C. And curiously, in 2016, co-founder Dan Taggart was sentenced on four third-degree felony charges, three for attempted forcible sex abuse, and one for attempted sex abuse of a child. The Ancestry.com headquarters are based in Lehigh, Utah, a town named after Lehigh, a prophet in the Book of Mormon. And I don't know about y'all, but I certainly didn't know this. One of the core tenets of the Mormon faith is that the dead can be baptized into the faith after their passing. Baptism of the dead evolved from the beliefs that baptism is necessary for salvation and that the family unit can continue to exist together beyond mortal life if all members are baptized. So I guess that explanation explains why the Mormons are so interested in tracing back family trees. For them, genealogy is a way to save more souls and strengthen the eternal family unit. Follow-up question to that statement I read directly off the internet. Is it a way to trace back family units or is it a way to keep track of bloodlines? It's reported that Utah's population is 67% Mormon, but Mormon temples aren't the only thing you'll find in the Salt Lake State. You'll find our NSA overlords layer there, otherwise known as the Utah Data Center, aka the Intelligence Community Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative Data Center, which is a data storage facility out in the middle of nowhere for the United States intelligence community, and it's designed to store mega amounts of data. Interesting, right, when you factor in what Ancestry DNA is doing. Through their DNA testing, you can learn a lot about yourself, how your genetics can influence your risk for certain diseases. You can trace your ancestry, and if you're thinking about starting a family, you can find out if you're a carrier for certain inherited conditions. The company was co-founded by Ann Wojcicki, ex-wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Fair warning, I'm one of those people who automatically associates Google with government intelligence because there's evidence out there to support the blurred lines between intelligence agents agencies, social media networks, and search engines. Look at this cool interactive chart I found documenting the amount of times that the Obama administration met with Google at the White House. 
Speaking of the White House and Google, you might have seen Sergey in the news recently. He made headlines when he joined a protest against Trump's immigration order. Sergey's family immigrated from the Soviet Union to the United States in 1979 to escape Jewish persecution. And as a child, he attended the John Hopkins Center for Talented Youth, an academic institution with famous alumni like Mark Zuckerberg and Lady Gaga. Sergey and his ex-wife are fascinating folk. Back in 1998, Sergey set up an office in Ann's sister Susan's garage. Since Susan is now the CEO of YouTube, you would think that when her sister uploads a video to her 23andMe channel, you would think that if she's going to boost it up with fake views, that she would at least throw some bots in there to, I don't know, like it, dislike it, comment on it. Isn't this strange? Millions of views, 10 likes. Ancestry.com's YouTube channel is m only marginally better. If you look at a video with comparable views, then you see that there are, there's much more engagement on the video. Also, I noticed 23andMe uses leading technology from a San Diego biotech firm called Illumina to genotype your DNA. In 2014, Ant said that 23andMe would have one of the largest databases out there, if not the largest, and that would enable her scientists to do a tremendous amount of discovery into the possible genetic causes of ailments like Parkinson's disease. And I just want to say this before all the science enthusiasts out there start shaming me for criticizing scientific research. Just because you were groomed to work with integrity doesn't mean that your bosses were or that anyone above them holds them to any standard of integrity. What's the government going to do? Police itself? I'll show you where my train of thought is going. Throughout the 20th century, thousands of Americans were sterilized without their knowledge or their consent in the name of improving the gene pool. If someone like me was to come out and say that while it was happening, imagine the public ridicule I would have received. While I know that research and scientific advancement saves lives, I also know that questioning what's in the Kool-Aid before you drink it also saves lives. Here's an example from 23andMe with their customers being their biobank on which to capitalize with various patents. Through this biobank that customers paid to be a part of, they were able to patent the technology for making designer babies in 2013. The idea is that you could say, I want to have this type of child and generate the DNA with that profile. But 23andMe assured the press they wouldn't be utilizing this patent which makes no sense in my simple mind. But the fact is the customer biobank DNA was utilized for this purpose. And guess what? It was outlined in the legal agreement. But when I look at both Ancestry.com and 23andMe, I see the government and military's fingerprints all over, which makes me wonder, is the government one of the third parties this data would be sold to? We wouldn't know. There's no transparency in the legal contracts on these websites that disclose who the third parties are. Will they sell your DNA information to an insurance provider? Although there's legislation that protects Americans from discrimination in health insurance and employment decisions on the basis of genetic information, which is known as the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, the law has a loophole. It only applies to health insurance. It doesn't say anything about companies that sell life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. Over the past few years, a growing issue with these DNA databases is that they'll hand your results over to the government if there's a warrant. There have been cases where the warrants to search DNA databases have been trying to link people to crimes. And since genes determine our facial features, scientists can build a 3D model of a face based on a person's DNA. And that also means if police find sufficient DNA at a crime scene, scientists will be able to build a model of the culprit. The overlying issue is scientists have demonstrated that it's possible to fabricate DNA evidence undermining the credibility of what was once considered the gold standard of proof in criminal cases. If you were a shifty character, it would be a dream to have a database of DNA that you could plant at various crime scenes, right? Which brings me to my final point on this. How can we ensure that the data and DNA will be handled ethically at all? And like I showed at the beginning of the video, you could speculate that 
DNA could be used for cloning purposes. They've been able to clone animals for a while. Why not humans? A movie called Boys from Brazil, released in 1978, is about Dr. Mengele cloning Hitler 95 times, giving pretty precise and accurate instruction on how to clone a human, and hoping to raise the resulting boys in Brazil with the ultimate goal of forming the Fourth Reich. And at the time that movie was released, everyone believed it to be fiction. But the Third Reich really did move to South America, in North America for that matter, and there is documentation of Mingala setting up clinics there. So which part of that movie was fiction? That they cloned Hitler 94 times instead of 95? And okay, I'll admit this is an extreme theory to follow, but I thought I'd throw it out there. My personal theory is that Google is the main third party buying up this data, storing not only your online habits, emails, and personal information in a database, but also your genetic makeup. And in the case of DNA, even if your family doesn't opt in and do their own DNA tests, it doesn't matter. Google still has that information on them because they have your DNA. It's sort of similar to the way you don't even have to have a Facebook profile for Facebook to build a shadow profile on you. They can build a profile about you based on the information that friends and family, coworkers, or just anyone out there has about you, even if you don't have an account. While all of this information is sort of disturbing, I'm kind of conflicted on if it even matters. Hospitals have been pricking newborns' heels and collecting blood samples to test for genetic, metabolic, and developmental disorders since the 1960s. And if they didn't get you at birth, you gotta do a DNA test if you join the military. And if they don't get you with any of those things, they're gonna get you at your workplace. The March 2017 bill would allow employers to impose financial penalties on employees who don't participate in the company wellness programs. It would also allow those wellness programs to mandate genetic screening for participants. And furthermore, it would allow the results of that screening to be shared with third parties, including non-health professionals. In my opinion, all of that is overtly intrusive, which makes me ask, if everyone is aware, does anyone care? In general, we're all pretty complicit in the annihilation of our own privacy. We had a chance to defend it, but we chose convenience instead. And with the emergence of data mining now in cahoots with DNA mining, we know that the more information there is about you, the more predictable you get. And I wouldn't think for a second that this information will be used to benefit you.